Welcome to The River Has No Fear of Memories, a series of conversations with Girish Karnad. This podcast is brought to you by the Bangalore International Center. My name is Arshia and I'm here with Anmol. We recorded these conversations with Girish right before his death in June 2019. In these episodes, we have a chance to listen to Girish's wide-ranging observations about his life and his work. We will hear excerpts from his plays and discussions about his legacy as an artist and as a public intellectual. So those of you who know Girish's work will recognize this song from Hayavadna. This is where we get the title for this session and for our upcoming podcast series. The music you just heard is by MD Pallavi and Konark Reddy. Uh, we would like to thank Ajay Krishnan, uh, who started this project with us a few years ago. Uh, the podcast is supported by the Nilankeni Foundations. Uh, the philanthropies are many thanks to them. So Girish Karnad uh, was so many things. Uh, he was so many things to so many people. He wore so many hats. Uh, some people think of him uh, as a movie star, uh, as an actor. Some people think of him as a filmmaker. Some people know him perhaps just as the voice at Ranga Shankara that tells you to turn off your mobile phone. But if you spoke to Girish Abba, if you asked him, who are you? What are you? Unequivocally, Always, he said, I'm a playwright. But that wasn't always the case. He became a playwright. So we've been working on this podcast series for a couple of years. Girish died in June 2019. And uh, one of the reasons um, it's taken us this long is because it's difficult. I mean, you can see even getting the disembodied voice to speak is causing some discomfort. Um, but of course, also, um, you know, there was the pandemic. We were locked into our homes uh, separately. Uh, and um, we tried to do a lot of work um, virtually, but uh, um, that didn't work out. Um, so we're hoping that um, uh, the podcast series will be ready on the BIC platform early next year. Um, and actually, the, the way you're going to see us interacting with notes and all of that is pretty much how we put the series together, because uh, uh, you, we had conversations with Girish over a week, and um, they were kind of freewheeling, and uh, you know, so Anmol had to take things from uh, different conversations and and uh, patch them together. So, and then we would sit with our notes and say, okay, this is what we have to say. So this is how we look even when we were recording the podcast. So this is quite the very similitude, if you were, uh, if you will, yeah. To be a poet. You, I must tell you that when I wrote my first poem, it just came. I wanted to be a poet. And I wanted to be a poet in English, you know. And I wanted to be with the Nobel Prize winner. This was part of the agenda, you know. And uh, you know, I wanted to be. I could. I could almost see W. B. Yeats, T. S. Eliot, W. H. R. and Girish Karna. You know that kind of, that that was the uh, image one carried. And um, and suddenly one day I wrote. And wrote a play in Canada. It completely astounded me because I didn't think I was a playwright. I didn't think I wrote in Canada. Wanted to write in Canada, and I was not interested in mythology, which was part of my growing up. But you know, I, it was Jayati the play, and and I wrote the play, and it had five female characters, four female characters. And no one touched me to the Bajpur. You know, for six years, 
nobody did my first play so that's the opening of our episode on playwriting and this should give you a sense of uh, the, the way our episodes are structured. We'll have Girish talking and then us setting up the context. Uh, and uh, where necessary, we'll unpack what he's saying. Um, and as Ashia said, it should be out next year. So please stay tuned. So, you know, a couple of years before Girish died, many of us, um, including his family, uh, tried to persuade him to have these conversations. Um, but he was reluctant. Yeah, I have a theory about that. Um, so, you know, I, I always connected that hesitation with uh, something that Girish had told me many years ago. Uh, Girish loved Akira Kurosawa, the great Japanese filmmaker. So, and he, he liked uh, the way Kurosawa had closed uh, his autobiography. Girish told me, you know what happens? Uh, Kurosawa's wife opens up the newspaper. Uh, they find out that Rashomon has won the Venice Film Award. And then Kurosawa says, uh, after that, I didn't have to worry about uh, what would go on my rice dish. And that's it. And, uh, and, and Girish said, that's quite all right. You know, that's how it should be. Because uh, why, you know, what else would you write in a memoir uh, after you have succeeded? Uh, because what follows is history. And, uh, you know, I, I wonder if, uh, if that's why he just chose to cover his early years yeah. in, in the memoirs that just uh, were published earlier this year, uh, this year in English. Yeah. I think they're available um, outside, actually. Uh, but, you know, so he was like, saying, oh, I'm not interested, I'm not interested. And suddenly one day in March uh, 2019, I get a call from Girish. Um, and he uh, says, so when are you doing the interviews? And I was like, oh, okay, um, May 1st. And he said, no, June 1st. Um, so that's what it was. We, um, we'd reach his um, home every evening at five o'clock. And for those of you who know Girish, he didn't dare to be late. Sometimes we'd wait downstairs till it was two minutes to five and then, you know, go up to the house. And he would spend a couple of hours with us, you know, um, and uh, we'd talk. Um, and, uh, you know, he never, never let us leave. He never let us go home without having one drink. Yeah. And Girish and his family are of course hospitable, but that didn't make for easy conversations. <laughs> you know, we, we thought that we would just uh, pick off from where, uh, the memoirs left and, uh, you know, fill in the gaps, uh, so as to say, but, uh, every evening without fail. Girish would come prepared with what he wanted to talk about. And uh, you know how that is, you know, <laughs> after that, we had no choice. We had to go with whatever he wanted to do. And uh, so, um, yeah, we hope to continue these conversations over the, the weeks. And uh, then uh, with his death, we were just left with these fragments. And uh, what we have done is just edited them together uh, into this, this podcast. Yeah, you know, for us... Um... I mean, putting these podcasts together, you know, it's, it's a little bit um, difficult to, to remember that uh, Girish is dead because he's remained alive for us. You know, we've been listening to his voice now for two years. We're immersed in his thoughts. I mean, his opinions, our heads are full of um, his opinions. And, uh, um, you know, we wanted to share that, to share this opportunity um, to listen again to um, a person who is truly one of the great minds of our time. Yeah, and uh, as we sat with these recordings, uh, some themes just kept cropping up. And so each of the episodes uh, revolves around one of those themes, uh, the geographies of Kannada literature, uh, the making of Indian theater, existentialisms, uh, being a public intellectual, and of course, the art and craft of playwriting. But you'll be relieved to know that it's not just Anmol and me talking to Girish and about Girish um, in these podcasts. Many of his colleagues and friends um, have commented, and you know they're they're, they're part of the uh, part of the recordings. Um, and uh, one of one of the people who who did a, a two lovely sessions with Girish actually is our very own and very dear uh, Vivek Shanbag, who unfortunately is not here today. Yeah, so we'll hear uh, Vivek uh, ask Girish about his relationship with Canada. You know, I worked very hard, as I told you. Nothing came to, except yeah. for the first play, which came like that. 
and I was addressed and I wrote it. After that, every play I do, I, I was just telling you, I have to say, now what makes, what will I do now? Ah, now I'll write a historical play. Which one should I write? Oh, Tughlaq is a good subject. Let me work on it. So I wrote Tughlaq. Now what should I write? I'll let me write about a folk tale. Like that. My language is also like that. Let me tell you. You see, my mother tongue is Tughlaq. Okay, Tughlaq. Um, and I grew up in Pune, where um, we also went to Marathi school. Then at the age of about three or four, me and my younger sister went to a proper Kannada medium school. Proper Kannada. So I started sitting on the plank with boys younger than me and learning Kannada. And then I came to Dharwar. And there, I suddenly went in Dharwar, I discovered what it is to have a language which can be a mother tongue. You know, it's rained, not learned from books, you know, from rain and so And Manohar Granthamalaya, all his G.B. Doshi, Kirtanath uh, Kutkut, we all spoke North Karnataka Kannada. So I taught myself that. So right through, I kept teaching myself to write in a Kannada which was not my own. You know, and right through, there were people, as I succeeded, there were people snapping at me saying, Girish doesn't know how to write Kannada. <laughs> you know that. <laughs> there was a whole school. Because I was successful despite my bad Kannada. <laughs> so, um, I, I told you we were with him every evening between five and eight. So, uh, you know, the birds were coming home. So they're saying, hello, hello, I'm here. So you, you heard the bird. Uh, there's also... Bangalore rush hour traffic on Lavelle Road. Uh, and there's also, of course, the, the um, Girish's own um, illness. He was on an ox oxygen machine and he also had an oximeter. So the audio is um, fuller than we would have liked it to be. So just, just bear with us on, on that. But you know, the, the, the thing that I learned from Girish that week was the, just the enormous amount of hard work that he put in. Uh, he, how he wrote and rewrote his plays for decades. Uh, it took him, what, 30 years to write Bali? And uh, he, you know, even in that week, uh, he was just telling us he's still not happy with it. Uh, so, uh, you know, and all of this is just in stark contrast with this idea of genius that things just came to him. Sure enough, you know, he grew up around all these languages. It was possible for him to make, uh, you know, have this range of associations. But, you know, Girish, not only did he choose uh, Kannada as the language of his literary expression and put in the necessary work for that, he sustained a deep engagement with his other languages, especially Marathi. Um, and, uh, you know, he made himself that rare person, a truly multilingual writer and think a thinker. Yeah, you know, um, um in the 90s, um, something Seagull Theatre Quarterly or something, I, I, I was asked about Girish and I said, oh, um, Girish is not a Kannada writer. He's a writer who writes in Kannada. I was really pleased with myself. You know, that's a pretty cool insight. Girish was so angry. He didn't speak to me for months, right? Uh, it took me a while to figure out that this is why he was not talking to me. Years later, and on a more than one occasion, he said, you said, I was not a Canada writer. And I was like chagrined. I was absolutely mortified you know, that I could have done this. Made yeah. Him so upset. Yeah, but you obviously got over that. I and did. uh, it yeah. didn't uh, keep Girish <laughs> from inflicting, and these are his words, uh, the drafts of his place on you. Um, so in these conversations, oh, we spoke a lot about Indian theater. Uh, we spoke with Girish about his peers and their works. He told us, how he loved Gashi Ram Kotwal and Anda Yog, and how he was fortunate uh, to be part of a generation uh, that came together to make what we now recognize as modern Indian theater. Um, so we let's let's listen to Girish uh, talk about one of his most important collaborators, B. V. Karan. I was lucky that Karan was there you know, to spark this out. Because we had no stage, you see. You see, we would sit at night and discuss, and, and all kinds of ideas would come. 
current means theatre. You know, current is a theatre man. So all the time, like with Hayavadana, you know, with Hayavadana, I had just yet the transport sets. And I said to Karan Pandey when we were talking, you know, there is this transport that story. We must make a film. I said, nice people. And Karan said, film. Make a film. She, film game better. Not come around. You know, not come around, you know. In a usual fashion. Not come around, not come around. So I said, my God, is that right? It's, it's really material. I said, yes, you're right. It's good material for a play. And Karan said, yes. Not only will you write, I know you'll write within the next 15 days. And I wrote. <laughs> so, you know, with Hayavadana, um, Girish and Karan and Satyadev Dubey, who directed it in Hindi, um, they succeeded in producing what I think is one of the seminal plays of um, Indian theater. Uh, the story is, a, is a, a, you know, from the uh, 12th, um, 12th century Sanskrit text, the Katha Sarit Sagra. Um, they're using masks, they're using folk forms. Karanth has made sure that there's folk music. Uh, and of course, as Giri says, um, his inspiration for Hayavadana came from transposed heads, from Thomas Mann's trans transposed heads. So even European literature is somehow, um, you know, brought into the mix. And um, Girish and his directors were somehow able to bundle all of this together and show us that it's possible to have um, modernity and tradition on, on stage uh, at the same time. Yeah, and I think one of the reasons uh, they could do this, uh, that this was possible, is because Girish and his contemporaries were just, uh, you know, they weren't afraid to push each other in, in private and in, in public. Uh, Girish would regale us with anecdotes uh, about this. And uh, uh, these stories of collaborations and rivalries are funny. Uh, they are constantly, constantly trying to outdo one another, even as they have this sense that they are in this together. Uh, that they are a community with a mission to find an idiom, Indian idiom yeah. in theater and an idiom uh, that they could use to address their very modern concerns. Yeah. Yeah. So it is, uh, the way he ran the Watson uh, Terrace, there was a big carpet. We came and slept, took our pillows and slept. And if we, if we were drunk, too, home, too drunk to go, we would sleep the night and get up and go or, or whatever it is. And one day I remember I, I went to sleep arguing with a Tindulkar and fell asleep. And next morning I woke up and next to wanted to continue the uh, argument. Next to who was there but Badal Sarta. Or a nightmare, eh? Sleeping next to one person and getting up next to another. Well, uh, Tendulkar got lucky. He escaped the morning after. And a rejuvenated Girish, let me say. Yeah. yeah. So th this is the kind of atmosphere in which these young men, men these, these theater wallas are living and breathing theater. Um, and we all know the play that put Girish on the national stage, Tughlaq, right? And even there, it was Karanth who was instrumental. Uh, Girish told us how during the 1965 war with Pakistan, uh, when Delhi was in a blackout, Karanth grabbed hold of an Urdu dictionary and sat next to a candle and translated Tughlaq uh, for the National School of Drama. And the rest, as they say, is history. Yeah, that, that, that's an amazing story, the candle and uh, Karanth. Uh, but also in the podcast series, we want to remind people, uh, especially also to introduce to a new generation, the power of Girish's words. Um, you know, he had this ability to, to create unforgettable characters to bring even a 12th century emperor um, close to us, you know, and for us to be inside Tughlaq's head um, and to be with him as he's, you know, making his, his grand plans. Um, so uh, we're going to listen to an excerpt from Tughlaq now. It's, um, <clears throat> um, it's a moment where the Sultan Muhammad bin Tughlaq has a crisis of confidence and it's read by Pritam Koil Pillai. <laughs> I was 21 
when I came to Dalatabad first and built this fort, I supervised the placing of every brick in it. And I said to myself, one day I shall build my own history like this, brick by brick. You know, one night I was standing on the ramparts of the old fort here. And there was a torch near me flapping its wild wings and scattering golden feathers on everything in sight. And there was a half-built gate nearby, trying to contain the sky within its cleft. And suddenly, something happened, as though someone had cast a spell. The torch, the gate, the fort, the sky, all melted and merged and flowed in my bloodstream with the darkness of night. The moment shed its symbols, its questions and answers, and stood naked and calm where the stars throbbed in my veins. I was the earth, the grass, the smoke, the sky. Suddenly a sentry called from afar, attention, attention. And the half-burnt torch and the half-built gate fell apart. No, young man, I don't envy you your youth. All that you have to face and suffer is still ahead of you. Look at me. I have searched for that moment since then, and here I am still searching for it. But in the last four years, I have seen only the woods clinging to the earth. I have heard only the howl of wild wolves in the answering bay of street dogs. Another 20 years and you'll be as old as me. And I might be lying under those trees there by then. Do you think you'll remember me then? You know, the poet in Girish really comes out in his monologues. Yeah, play after play, there will be a monologue. And it's just like, whoa, what are you saying? Um, but anyway, uh, like many other people, uh, myself included, um, Girish never quite recovered from the opening scene of Alec Padamsi's Tughlaq, where an all but naked Kabir Bedi, when he was young, uh, was wearing a red langot. Right, and is being dressed on stage uh, by um, by his minions. Um, but you know, it it was uh, Al Qazi's Hindi production and Alex's English production that really catapulted Girish into another, into a different league of of uh, playwrights. And Alec would later go on to call um, Tughlaq the best play in English written by an Indian. Yeah, and many people, uh, you know, argued that. Tughlaq was popular in the 60s and 70s uh, because it spoke to a certain zeitgeist. Uh, it was seen and read as a political play. In fact, the political play uh, about early independent India. So we asked Girish uh, whether that was what was on, on his mind as he was writing Tughlaq. Any political play reflects contemporary politics. India had become independent. And all these independent rulers, those who got us independence, Nehru, Patel, and so on, the people working with them had taken to corruption. We saw corruption all around, you know, cruelty all around. So, um, a disillusionment was setting in about with independence. A false disillusionment in the sense that it was inevitable, no country was going to be run by Mahatma Gandhi, but there it is. So, that disillusionment, one built into it. But then, of course, to spur one on was existentialism, angst, you know, on being misunderstood. Oh, how did you really all this, you know, the, I was accused actually of pinching from Caligula. Fortunately for me, it's not a good play. So it so didn't last. It's not as good a play as to be. So, uh, because Camus was essentially a cerebral 
you know, all his plays are, he puts on theories and works them out. Modest as always, <laughs> our dear Girish. <laughs> and don't miss the candor, the famous <laughs> forthrightness. So uh, those of us who had the pleasure to know Girish, know him, uh, knew him as a formidable intellect. Uh, when he came of age in the 1950s, uh, those were the heydays of existentialism all over the world. Uh, and Girish, uh, as a man of that generation, he was actively reaching out for, for the questions that were swirling around. Uh, does God really exist? If God doesn't exist, uh, what's the source of moral action? What is an authentic life? And uh, how is an individual to relate with others around them? But you know, when Girish takes on these philosophical questions, they're not abstractions, right? He writes them into the, uh, the dilemmas of his characters. I mean, uh, look at Tughlaq. Um, the protagonist, uh, Muhammad bin Tughlaq, he, he wants to change the world but he's tormented, like, is he doing the right thing? I mean, is this really for the greater good or is he, is he just going mad? So, you know, Dublak is constantly fighting with himself, yeah? And I mean, I think that the, these themes and questions that Girish takes on, they're timeless, you know? We relate to them now in 2021, um, even though the, the plays were written, you know, 50, uh, 60 years ago before you were even born. Well, even my parents were teenagers at that time. Oh, so there you go, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, Girish was just obsessed with existentialism. You see this yeah. uh, the, and, 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 and the existentialist questions, they keep cropping up in, in his play Flowers, uh, in Tale Danda, but, uh, you know, he does something with it. Uh, we know the terror uh, of living in a world without God. You know, that's something that society almost instills in us, that fear, uh, you know, if, if we live in a world without God, uh, you know, how will we know what's the right thing to do? But Girish, as an existentialist, he turns that problem on its head. Yeah, yeah. Um, he makes us confront the terror of living in a world where God does exist and where God acts and God can act to save you even when you are not worthy of that redemption. Uh, like, the, like the priest in, in flowers. And that's the bhakti problem, as Girish sees it. Yes, divine grace, that arbitrary intervention, yeah. right? It, it destroys the need to live an ethical life, to live by certain norms, because you know what? God can just intervene at any point of time and make your transgressions grow away. So what do you do? That is the point. Which morality prevails? If you want to live in a, a, a world which has morality, which morality prevails? Is it our morality, is it, is it king's morality, or is it God's morality? And if God's morality is such that it can, anyone can be upheld as right, then it's not morality at all. Because you know, human beings can't live. I don't know how to live. If tomorrow some Bhakti Tukaram can fly off on a guru, then what can I do? The blankness is left behind <laughs> if you really believe that kind of it, it, It's also what happens in Taridanda. You know, he says, I didn't take the money, but the people want him to have taken the money and the gods to have saved him. They, you know, they say, oh, no, 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 the treasury you had, you had emptied and the God came and filled it all up and saved you. You were this bhakta. And he says, but I didn't take the money. But the people want a miracle. Yeah, so here again in Taladanda, Girish takes a defining moment in Canada history, right? And the decimation of the Sharana movement in 12th century. And he again infuses it with his particular ethical concerns. Uh, Girish's Basavanna is committed to doing the right thing. You know, he's, he's running the state treasury in an honest manner. But people aren't interested in that. Many of his followers, uh, you know, they, they, they want something else. They don't want to follow his moral example. Uh, they would rather condemn him as a thief who is saved by God, uh, you know, so that they can get <clears throat> a miracle, uh, a proof of God's divinity rather than live by a moral code uh, that is consistent, that makes sense to them, 
or even to us. And, you know, Girish again asks this question of us, what does it mean to adopt such an attitude? What are the consequences for a society where people choose to adopt this as a way of life? Yeah, you know, Girish showed um, that in the late um, 80s, early 90s, uh, and it's very much uh, a response to what was happening here at the time, which of course was the Mandal and Masjid agitations. Um, and it was this period that um, saw him taking on a more and more, a larger role as, as, a, as a public in, intellectual. You know, he, he, he became um, like a conscience keeper uh, for us. Uh, actually more correctly, <laughs> I should say, he became a conscience keeper for those of us who believe in an egalitarian and plural India. Yeah, and of course, this came at a price. Uh, Girish was deeply hurt uh, because uh, people were just eager to condemn him as an old man, uh, you know, somebody who was no longer relevant, who was just uh, seeking attention, uh, another chance, uh, you know, to say like yeah. in, the, in the spotlight. Yeah, yeah. You know, even here at BLF, at an early BLF, um, Girish was heckled and he was booed and, you know, people wouldn't let him speak. And this is ironic beyond anything because it was a panel on the uh, freedom of, 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 of expression. Um, and it did hurt him, I, I remember that clearly. Um, and that was followed by this, you know, hullabaloo about <laughs> remarks on Tagore and um, then about, about Tipu. Um, yeah, and most memorably uh, at the Tata Lit Live in 2012, uh, where, uh, you know, we have the Nobel laureate, Sir Vidya Nayapal, uh, being awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, you know, Girish walked right up to that podium and uh, held a mirror to all of us. Uh, what does it mean uh, for uh, a person who had such dangerous prejudices towards an Indian religious minority, for such a person to be publicly felicitated by other Indians? Yeah. Why were we pandering, you know, to, to someone like Naipaul. Yeah. Naipaul, I hated from the word. I met him once and couldn't stand him. See, I was in London at the Nehru Center and he appeared on a BBC program talking to Nisha Pillay, you know, in which he lambasted the Muslim. They have destroyed Indian culture. They have contributed nothing and so on and so on. I was horrified. So I, I told wrote to the BBC and they said, no, look, I'll, re I'll have to reply to it. They said, sorry, you're a member of the government of India. You have to come through High Commission. So I waited. I waited till I got the right. That has been my great uh, strength. I can wait. Years. And then I read him and then I realized that dear Naipaul doesn't understand Indian music. And I said, ah, the Lord God had delivered him in my hands. So, so Grish ran with this music bit and he lay into Naipaul. He called Naipaul tone deaf, a person who knew little about Indian culture. Because for Grish, uh, you know, we know that, uh, that uh, you know, for him, Naipaul had missed out completely on the syncretism that lay at the very heart of the best of Indian traditions. Um, in the last decade of his life, you know, as the India that Girish believed in was increasingly under assault, um, he became more and more uh, uh, politically active. Um, Girish meant many, many things to me. Um, he took me and Sanjay under his wing when we first came to Bangalore in 1990, and he was, uh, of course, he was a friend, but he was also an intellectual companion, a mentor. Um, and a guide, so I feel his loss very deeply. I feel a personal loss. But I also think about what it means for all of us to lose him, um, lose this kind of public figure and citizen um, that he was. Um, because who will now raise their voice as he did? Who will stand up for us when so many of us feel in danger? Um, we find ourselves unable to act, um, unable to speak. Um, 
And for me, there is one indelible image of um, Girish's political activism. When you see it, you'll know that it's, you, you, you all remember this image. <clears throat> So while the image comes on, uh, I'm going to read uh, from the afterword to Girish's memoirs. This, uh, this has been written by his children, uh, Raghu and Radha. They write, One of the last public events he went to was at the town hall in September 2018, on the anniversary of Gauri's assassination. A lot had happened in the preceding months, including the arrest on bewildering grounds of a, state of, of a slate of activists and scholars all summarily denounced as urban Naxals. At the time, Appa struggled to walk more than a few meters at once, even with an oxygen machine. On the inside stairs up to the auditorium level, he seemed almost ready to faint, swaying and hanging onto the banister with both hands. But he finished the climb and made his entrance into a hall packed to the rafters with a placard around his neck declaring, me too, Urban Naxal. So you might disagree um, with Girish about his politics and, uh, and the positions that he took publicly. Um, but I think there's one thing that is absolutely beyond dispute, um, that Girish is a great playwright. And I, I would go as far to, as to say that he is the modern Indian playwright. He is the playwright of our times. And uh, in the best of his works, Girish asks, you know, the big philosophical questions, be it for us as individuals or for us as a society. And he makes us confront them on the stage right there. The river has no fear of memories. And, you know, Girish could be brutal with his candor. Uh, you know, he was forthright and... <laughs> Um, I was at least terrified of him. Uh, but our dear Girish also had no fear of history, be it the dreams of Tipu Sultan or his last play, Crossing to Talikota, which was published a few months before he died. Uh, he, you know, Girish, time and again, he, he demands that we think with him, that we think anew and think afresh about our stories and about our histories. And uh, as I was working on this podcast with Arshi, I realized this is his great gift to us. Yeah. That's a great line that Girish has no uh, fear of history. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, putting uh, these podcasts together has been a deeply moving experience, um, not because we love Girish not only because we love Girish, but also because he continues to speak to us. Um, he continues to show us what we sometimes find very difficult to see. Um, Girish brought the best of the world to Kannada theatre, to Indian theatre, but he also brought the best of himself, his curiosity, his brilliance, but all of that had only one intention. And that was an opportunity. Because how many playwrights get a chance to worry about? I mean, it, it, in those days, everyone said he compromises. He acts in Hindi films. Okay, he can speak Hindi, and he's five foot eleven inches, so he can get on in the second rate uh, roles and so on. That's okay. But but how many people get a chance to worry all the time? But how to say that line? I told you yesterday, you know, Karan's comment on uh, Nishan. Said, your body has no stiffness. You limp. And those little things, you don't realize. You know, that it's, these are tricks of these nuts and bolts that only a teacher can teach you. And you need it. Fortunately, I have people like Satyadev Dede, Karan, who guided me in that way. Like Ravi Shankar said, although he played with jazz musicians, with Japanese musicians, he never played a single note which is not Indian music. What he played was always Indian music. But he played Indian music that went with oh, 
you know. And I would say that I, to some extent, even though I acted in bad films, I acted badly because at that time I didn't know what was acting. You know, 27 as you start acting. And I can see how stiff and boring I am, I thought. But after that, everything I learned in films went into theatre. You know, I, I, I struggled to be a better writer. So that's it. The River Has No Fear of Memories, a podcast brought to you by BIC. Anmol and Arshia, thank you so much. This was such a beautiful session. Can we have another huge round of applause? Uh,